Hello and welcome to another How Conversation on Moral Leadership. I'm Brigadier General Air Force retired Dana Bourne and a distinguished fellow with the Howe Institute for Society. And today we have an amazing conversation on moral leadership with Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, who is the president of the Navy War College. I know we're going to have an exciting conversation. Welcome, Admiral Chatfield. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and an honor to join you uh, in this interview. I've had a wonderful experience at the Howe Institute uh, last year, and it's just nice to be with you again. Admiral Shoshana Chatfield is currently the president of the Naval War College and is the first woman to ever hold that position. She hails from Garden Grove, California, and came to Boston University for her Bachelor of Arts and participated in the Naval ROTC program there. Uh, One thing I'm just really proud for you is that you've been nominated to be promoted to vice admiral and assigned as the U.S. military representative to NATO on the military committee in Brussels, Belgium. We wish you well with that, and we're just so grateful to have you here. Now, you have a statement on one of the articles about you that said, service found me, and I want to get into that conversation a little bit and get at some of your life story and how this brings you into your current service. So who influenced you or mentored you early on in your career and helped this shape the trajectory of service in your life and your leadership? It will probably surprise you to hear that um, I'm a Trekkie. I'm a (laughs) Star Trek original series. And when I think about the way I relate to the world, I think about it in terms of being open and attentive to all kinds of people, all kinds of different experiences, and to see people in their own context and to value that for the humanity of it, uh, to value that for the productivity of the person as they want to be. And I think it forms the foundation of how I think about respecting others and appreciating who they are. Uh, Would you share with us maybe a tough, crucible, difficult time in your career where you felt like you had to make like a decision, but there were really no good options and how you maybe had to rely on your values to guide you through that decision? Well, um, I would just say for any young person out there uh, who's thinking about, well, what do I do when I have to make a hard decision, especially about myself? Uh, Because when we're young, we're learning and we're striving and we don't know where our talents really lie. And so we're trying things on. And in college, like so many others, I reached a moment where I was not succeeding in a course and I made a a decision to drop that course. And Uh, to keep the scholarship, even though I was a French major and an international major, international relations major, I had to take and pass two courses of physics and two courses of, um, well, calculus-based physics and two courses of calculus. And so it was this sort of last physics class and I, I withdrew. And I went back to California And I took a leave of absence and that bought me a little bit of time to see how I would uh, really negotiate that. And I cross enrolled to UCLA and I enrolled in navigation courses. Uh, There were two navigation courses at Boston University that would have taken me an entire year to complete. But at UCLA, they were on the quarter system and I was able to accomplish them in the time frame that I was there for the one semester to make up this physics course. And the result of that was to come back to Boston University with sufficient time left on my scholarship to be able to go to France as an exchange student for the entire year, take courses in French language and in international relations taught in French. And it was something that I would have not had the opportunity to do if I had stayed at Boston University. So it's a hard decision to admit, I've got to change something and I've got to manage my time better. I was working 40 hours a week. I was not spending the time related to that 
course the way I should have. And it took removing myself from the situation, understanding how I was learning, recommitting to that, getting some support from outside, which I got from my parents who were very supportive of that decision, and then figuring out how to make something more of it. So doubling down for success is a very difficult choice when you have a choice to walk away also. And so I'm curious if you would share with us something about the leadership frameworks that you have at the Naval War College that might apply to uh, organizations of different sizes and different sectors and around the world. We have a Navy leader development framework here uh, that the Navy implements and that naval officers are exposed to throughout their careers. And the focus there is on competency, character, and connection. And that connection piece was not in the original leader development framework, but was added in a subsequent version. And it's so important today to consider connection as we look at character and competence, because connection is the piece where trust is built. And connection is the piece where loyalty, understanding are developed between seniors, peers, and subordinates. And resiliency is formed around connection. And that's really hard in this world of so much to do and so much time to to be uh, focused on different things. We're all moving so fast. But being intentional about those connections, I think, is really, really important. So that's one piece. That's the Navy piece. But here at the Naval War College, we also use Kolb's framework for experiential learning. And that's part of our leader development as well, because at different moments in time, an officer might be aware of the why. Um, Why did I make this decision? Um, I considered these things. It's usually very rational. It could be duty oriented. It could be um, utilitarian, uh, the greatest uh, benefit for the most people. But the longer you stay in service, uh, I think the better you have a facility to say that that's not the only decision I'm going to make. I'm not going to just answer this question today, but I'm going to Uh, almost like in playing pool, uh, you learn to leave yourself a better shot next time. A great answer. And and you're someone who is, you know, running a war college. And I'm guessing you have quite a few moral challenges yourself. And how do you, uh, how do you apply some of these frameworks for your moral leadership and the moral challenges you face and instill them in the really senior leaders that are entrusted to your leadership as they're going to school at the Naval War College? Being a moral leader is being a leader who's willing to engage ethically in a self-reflection and also maybe in a broader conversation about how and why we're doing things. And that's, that's complex. It's It takes a level of maturity. It takes intention. But making these decisions um, carefully and building trust through communicating about them, and it's not easy to bring transparency into that discussion uh, so that you can walk away. I, I would be able to walk away thinking, well, I was true to my values, but I I learned something more about myself by really engaging in some empathy, uh, by talking to others, to hear other perspectives that I might not self-generate. How have you found that in terms of your organizational leadership and addressing the so many societal issues uh, that are coming up? Uh, that are across the map, right? Organizations are dealing with them as well. How do you deal with them in challenges facing uh, you as an educational leader? 
uh, about three years ago, after the murder of George Floyd, we engaged in a process called Task Force One Navy. And uh, I was really just grateful to uh, a fellow naval admiral named um, Alvin Halsey. Uh, he's a vice admiral now, and he led an effort called Task Force One Navy to engage in considering what we were doing well and where we may have fallen short on keeping the faith with our sailors. And we learned a lot through that process. And one of the things that uh, Vice Admiral Halsey actually recommended was to have more listening sessions. I view our service as a set of unique individuals who bring different talents and competencies. And we hire people to have their competency, but everybody has something more. And if we don't recognize what that is that people bring, uh, we're underserving them in terms of appreciating who they are, and we're underserving our organization in facilitating and supporting the expression of that. And if we truly want to be a world-class organization, we have to be able to access all of that talent and energy that people bring. And if we're not recognizing them, if we're not seeing them, and if we're not supporting them in the way that they need to be supported, we will be underutilized. Uh, very inspiring and, and leading while listening and also seeing the humanity and the gifts in each person and to get those, to learn those is through listening. It's a wonderful lesson for all of us. Well, let's uh, go to your time at the House Summit in December. And we want to thank you again for participating in that discussion on moral leadership. And you spoke about on the stage uh, for all of us, the importance of trust and team trust. And your quote, if I have this correctly, was building trust means sometimes a leader has to give up a belief that you've held on to for a long time. Would you expand on that for us and give us an example of a time when maybe you had to let go of a long held belief? I think when I came into service, uh, I remember wanting to be not noticed for being a woman in service. I wanted to be a pilot like any other pilot. I didn't want to be seen as a female pilot. And along the way, I was able to go to one of these uh, large uh, women in service conferences. And I was a fairly senior person by that time. I was a, a Navy captain. I'd been in the service for more than 20 years. And I was followed and chased down by a woman who said, thank you. And I thought, well, what, am, what are you thanking me for? And she said, thank you for wearing your hair back the way I do. And so thank you for being a senior officer who's not hiding her feminine side. And I thought, am I not hiding my feminine side? I, I, I hadn't thought about it that way. My hair had grown long and I had put it back. But then I thought about the things that I was not challenging. Uh, for example, I was very forgiving um, throughout my career at being called sir. Um, and it's, it, it's sometimes funny uh, to be called sir and, and sometimes a little bit annoying to be imagined or assumed to be a man uh, simply because you're successful. And so I thought, you know, now I've got some, uh, some energy and I've got the ability to bring some awareness about that. And it won't cost me the same way it will cost this young person uh, to raise that in different fora. You also at the summit talked about moral courage. And you said the idea of moral courage is very relative because we don't know how any single person is experiencing their life. And so we don't know what it takes for them to present with moral courage. And as a leader, a senior leader, how do you help people build their moral muscle and use their moral courage without demanding too much, given we don't know what's happening in their lives? Expressing empathy 
is really very helpful in number one, building trust, but number two, understanding perspective. Because um, you can you can start to understand where one person might be expending more energy just to make it through the day. And when you talk about acting authentically, um, and I, I used to smile when uh, when I would hear people tell me, well, you know, we hired you because you're you and we want you to be yourself. And I kept asking myself, well, is that really true? Is that really true that you want me to be myself in the, in the job that I have in, in this setting? I couldn't believe it. Um, and when I think about how it feels for me to walk through the door every day and be excited about coming to work and being in this community and, and feeling like the things that I'm doing are relevant and could be appreciated. And I look at each person that comes into this organization, I feel like each one should have that same moment. And you made a quote that said, people come in with different perceptions about what a good leader is. And it's not the leadership at the time, but the legacy of the leader organizationally that endures. And so this is a two-part question, but first, what are the qualities that you look for in a good leader? And secondly, how can leaders or especially moral leaders make sure that their influence kind of outlasts or outlives in a legacy in their organization? What's your advice for our next generation moral leaders of leaving a moral leadership legacy and helping create this wave? I would encourage young leaders to really probe into how, how meaningful and deep are the relationships and can they be trusted? Um, and what I mean by can they be trusted is, have we done enough work? Because relationships are a give and take and to get good feedback and to get good information, there has to be some trust. Leadership is about uh, relationship, uh, maybe a little bit of influence, uh, and certainly mutual growth through the experience together. And that's why the communication piece is so important. And if we're not attentive to the relationship uh, and to go past some of these facsimiles of relationship that we have or apparent relationships, but without depth, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would advise that young leaders think a little bit uh, more deeply about developing relationships. Probably a very um, big question, but one that I can't pass up for our listeners is what you believe right now is our biggest threat to global security. I look at the misinformation that there is in the world and we're bombarded with it. And now we're seeing manipulation of images. And so I do think that being skeptical about how information is presented, um, to be skeptical about hearing from somebody what another person's intent was without seeing for yourself, um, and finding places where there is trustworthy uh, research and trustworthy information being presented. Um, I, I'll just say that it's one of the most reassuring things about working here at the Naval War College is this faculty and these students are really attentive to the information that they are um, providing in this environment, that their uh, academics are looking deep into their disciplines. Uh, the information that we are posting on our website is information where we can trace back how it was obtained, where the analysis originated from, and, and why the conclusions are what they are. But there's so much misinformation out there. So I would say that is probably the biggest 
Well, thank you. And I hear ethical boundaries and lots more in your answer. We're so happy for you that you're moving on to uh, a promotion. Uh, I know it's just a nomination at this point, but to vice admiral and heading into a very big and important uh, new position. Uh, share with us how you're thinking about that that next chapter of your uh, you know service and your helping to apply your moral leadership to some of these real big issues that we are facing. Well, thanks for that question. It's um, really an honor uh, to be considered for a job like that, to uh, to pay a lot of attention to uh, one of these uh, longest uh, treaty alliances that the United States has, um, one of these uh, efforts to guarantee peace. Well, Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, we are so happy for you. Uh, we're grateful to you. I know our listeners share with me a thank you for your partnership with the Howe Institute for Society and particularly for your example of moral leadership and moral courage. We wish you all the best in your next assignment and uh, thank you. We salute you and we wish you well in your next chapter of service and your legacy. Thank you, Dana. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Been fantastic. Thank you, ma'am.